Hi there, my friend. It's Lukasz from Enterfea. Today, I will show you the influence of boundary conditions on the design of steel hopper. You can see here the geometry of the hopper. From today's topic standpoint, the most important fact is that the hopper stands on the concrete slab, or to be more precise, on the steel plate embedded in concrete. It won't be welded to this plate, but simply stand on it, so this is a typical contact problem. This means that the correct solution should include a support that only carries uh, compressive contact stress, while allow deformations in uplift vertical direction. Of course, such a solution was implemented. Here you can see the outcome of the analysis. The stress distribution and exaggerated deformation with the increase of the load. Of course, the load was increased far beyond the design values, simply so we can see how the model behaves post failure. Since we want to compare the outcomes with different other boundary conditions that are possible here, I've created a stability path for the node in the corner of the support beam. We will compare this chart with the charts obtained for different solutions. Let's think for a second what a possible mistake I could make. Well, I think that the simplest one would be to simply assume that uh, where the contact is, actually both compressive and tensile forces are being carried. I mean, this is like the most common approach, right? It simply stands on the ground, nothing is happening, so I will simply support the entire bottom flange of the supporting beam and I will assume that everything is just fine. This is the mistake number one. I've created to show you how big influence such an approach would have on outcomes. Again, you see the von Mises stress distribution. Note how little stress there is in the supporting beams. They seem not loaded at all. If you look close enough, you will notice that the only part in stress in the support region are the stiffeners in the supporting beams. This is because we allowed for the tensile force to be carried in the support. This means that the main beams aren't in torsion anymore and the tensile force in the stiffeners stabilize the model, even though it shouldn't. Mistake number one is the worst mistake we could make. It made a huge difference. Allowing tensile forces to be carried by our support is actually pretty important if you think about how this model works. The load in the hopper is eccentric when you think about the supporting beams. This means that those beams are actually in torsion. If you start carrying tensile forces, then this torsion is problem is somewhat mitigated. As you can see, there is no real stress in the beams, which means that if you would make such a mistake in this hopper design, you would get the supporting beams that are way too small to support the weight of the structure. And that would be catastrophic in consequences. Also note how short the stability path is in this case. This is because of plastic strain in the vertical stiffeners. Since the entire structure is basically hanging on tension force in 12 places in the model, the stresses there and resulting plastic strains are so high that there is a very significant convergence problem. The second mistake can be just as popular as the first one. Let's assume that we will make a linear support under the web of the supporting beam. I mean, in a lot of different structural problems, this is a typical solution that you support the beam under the web. This is where the load is, right? Unfortunately, in this case, this produces a much higher eccentricity than there is in reality. This in turn means that the torsion in supporting beams gets significantly higher. You can see in few places that the beam 
is actually destroyed due to torsion. This is a very conservative approach and unfortunately would not bring a correct result. This model problems with capacity can be easily seen on stability path. Note that the path begins to greatly increase the translation even before the load multiplier reaches a value of 1. This is where the model lost capacity, not to mention very high plastic strains in places where the beam failed. After I have analyzed the mistake number 2, I am already a bit wiser. I know that the eccentricity in this case is very important, so I can pinpoint the exact spot where I will make a linear support. Obviously, that would be the inside edge of the supporting beam, where the rotation will actually took place. This seems like a very reasonable approach. The only problem is that usually in square plates, like a concrete slab for instance, if you press the square plate from the top, actually the corners of the plate goes up. So here, when I make such a linear support, I cannot be sure if I won't get any negative reaction forces near the corners. That would stabilize the model in a way that it shouldn't be stabilized, so it will also have an impact on outcomes. Just as in other cases, you can see the stress distribution in the model with the increase and then decrease of the load. Note that it actually looks quite similar to the first solution. Look at the chart on the right. The correct solution with contact is in red and the solution with mistake number 3 is green. You can see that actually there is a quite significant difference there. This has two reasons. The first one is that I've mentioned before. In corners, I actually got negative reaction forces, which means that the model got certain stabilizing effects that shouldn't be there, which increased capacity. But also, I assume that the rotation will take place exactly at the edge of the beam. Most likely, the flange deforms a bit, and this moves the center of rotation further away from the hopper, increasing the eccentricity and, in turn, increasing the torsional moments in the supporting beam, which increase the load they get and decrease the overall capacity. I hope that this example managed to show you how important boundary conditions can be in analysis. It's actually pretty incredible that even in such a simple case, where something is literally standing on the steel plate, boundary conditions are so significant. When I'm in doubt, I usually go with the more complex approach. By this I mean if I know that there is a contact and I'm uncertain how things will play out, I will simply model it. Of course, this means that I need to play with the convergence a bit more and the analysis takes longer. But in the end, I very rarely regret such an approach. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you are interested in finite element analysis, I've made a free introductionary course to nonlinear buckling and also some issues correlated with stress design and imperfections. You can get access to the free course by following the link below. I would greatly encourage you to do so if you haven't seen it already. Thank you for watching and have an awesome day. If you have any questions or remarks, you can leave them in the comment section below. See you next time.